In the previous video, we discussed how early Hollywood depicted Native Americans as violent savages, while later portrayals shifted to show them as peaceful spiritual victims of white oppression. Both of these views distort reality and obscure true history. I propose that Seattle was not built by European settlers in the late 1800s, but by the Mongolian Tartarian people, a technologically advanced civilization that spanned parts of modern-day China, Russia, Canada, and the western United States. This empire, allegedly destroyed by aerial warfare and floods, has been erased from history, with its survivors becoming the indigenous peoples we recognize today. I supported this claim with the mythology of the native Duwamish people, who describe an ancient world destroyed by floods, fire, and disease, echoing similar story across other cultures. Continuing from that research, I examined how the city's grid-like layout, extending from Seattle to Olympia, Washington, may be evidence of a pre-existing metropolis built long before settlers arrived, not simply the result of the Klondike Gold Rush. Historical records and maps from the 1700s, which I reviewed, seem to contradict the mainstream narrative that Seattle was founded in 1851. These maps reveal detailed surveys and English-named ports, long before European settlers supposedly came. The absence of native Duwamish towns and the unexplained presence of these ports on the maps raise significant questions about the accepted timeline of Seattle's development. I concluded that the large cities may have been buried by floods and later excavated, as history fails to provide evidence of the immense construction efforts that must have occurred between 1875 and 1890. Now, I'm continuing this video series with part 2. If you feel like you've missed anything, be sure to check out the previous video, the link is in the description. I recommend watching it to get the full picture. So, without further ado, fasten your pants and let's get started. In 1889, we have the Great Seattle Fire. If you've watched my videos on Chicago, San Francisco, Melbourne and other places, you see they use the same pattern and same script everywhere to burn down the old world. While well, newspaper articles of the era speak about how a city was burned to the ground, they make no mention of how it was built. Some of the majestic architecture was supposed to have been built for the exposition of 1909, after which they were destroyed. This one was allegedly built for the expo. The idea for the exposition came from a man by the name of Godfrey Chilander, a member of the semi-secret society called the Arctic Brotherhood. According to their website, every gold mining town in the West had a chapter of this fraternal organization. I've already elaborated on the exposition hoax elsewhere. I don't believe these buildings were built for the expo. They were excavated, featured one last time, then destroyed. The intention was to eradicate the memory of the old world so that they could create a new one according to their ideas. The communist revolutions of the 20th century that destroyed millions of old buildings were a continuation of a great reset that had been raging since the 1700s. Their reason for destroying everything was to get people to envision what can be, unburdened by what has been. But the world they've created doesn't seem all that appealing, and many are hoping that one day, the Tartarian Empire strikes back. This photograph shows the navy at the opening ceremony of the expo. Notice the pillar lined with swastikas. The swastika is a common Native American symbol. It's also common in Tibet, Mongolia, and India. Before the 1930s, it had nothing to do with Nazis. There are numerous connections between Mongolians, indigenous Iberians, which are both Tartarians according to old maps, and Native Americans. They also look alike. If I had presented this to you without caption, you probably couldn't tell if she is Asian or Native American. Old world maps show there used to be passage between Siberia and Alaska. Not that they needed the passage, being competent seafarers. Canada, northwestern US, Russia, Mongolia and northern China all used to belong to Tartaria, so say the maps. This is why western Canada and northwestern US used to be shown as unknown lands. They weren't unknown, but they were controlled by the enemy. This photograph shows Siberian Inuit Eskimos who were shipped to the 1909 Expo. The official emblem of the Expo, symbolizing the exchange between an Asian woman and a white woman. From Wikipedia, quote. Duwamish society was divided into an upper class, lower class, and slave class. Each of these classes were largely hereditary, although social movement did happen. 
nobility was based on impeccable genealogy, intertribal kinship, wise use of resources, and possession of esoteric knowledge about the workings of spirits and the spirit world, making an effective marriage of class, secular, religious, and economic power. There were physical distinctions for high-status individuals. Mothers carefully shake the heads of their young babies, binding them with cradle boards just long enough to produce a steep sloping forehead. My point is. We find similar customs and beliefs around the world, including Siberia and Mongolia. According to an article on artificial cranial deformation, this was mainly practiced by Eurasian tribes, as well as Native Americans. People with elongated heads were considered higher class in an ancient three-class caste system. Elongated heads have been associated with the gods. Modern elites are still fond of the long heads. This is a photo of Linda Rothschild beside long head sculpture. I visited the website of the Library of Congress and searched in their newspaper archives for Washington State, 1860 to 1900, keyword excavation. I got back 3281 results. Despite the press, even back then, being tightly controlled and steered toward fake history. Many of the results were offers or ads for excavation. Despite being a fairly small town, excavation was all the rage in early Seattle. This is a sample from 13 September, 1890, from the Seattle Intelligencer. The snippet also uses the word grading. This word means the leveling of an area through the removal of hills, elevations and dirt, or the addition of such. These are some images of late 1800s and early 1900s Seattle, which show evidence of excavation. The fact of excavation is proven by the lack of vegetation from the dirt. If this hill had seen any sunlight, you'd see grass, plants, bushes and trees growing on it. You're asked to believe that these three buildings and hundreds like it were built using horse carriages. Where did the stone and brick come from? Of the 3,000 inhabitants, how many were able-bodied men, capable of construction? Let's say half of them were women. That leaves us with 1,500. Let's say half of those were children or elderly. That leaves us with 750. Let's generously assume only half of those had other jobs or were busy with gold digging. That leaves us with a few hundred. But they had gold, they could afford to employ outside help. Okay. Fair enough. From where? At around the same time, hundreds of other towns in the West were miraculously developing at breakneck speed. Surely the Masons were busy building their own cities and had no time to lend Seattle a hand. I found no Hollywood movie that references these massive construction undertaking. Almost every movie promotes the cowboy and Indian narrative exclusively. Tearing down the hills. The postcard speaks for itself. Hills were torn down because Seattle was not built, it was excavated. If it had been built, we'd know when, how, where, who, built the city. I came across this item of a company advertising for odorless excavation. Apparently excavating the buried city caused a lot of bad smells. Mainstream historians refer to the excavation of Seattle as regrading. They love using deceptive labels to reframe what was actually going on. From Wikipedia, quote. The topography of central Seattle was radically altered by a series of regrades in the city's first century of urban settlement, in what might have been the largest such alteration of urban terrain at the time. Seattle's first 58 regrades consisted largely of cutting the tops off high places and dumping the dirt into low places and onto the beach. So, rather than Seattle was excavated, they say Seattle was re-leveled. A rewording, however, does not change the facts. If you find it interesting, I'll continue in part 3.